Welcome to episode 43 of the Rex Chapman Show with my super dope homeboy from the L-Town, Josh Hopkins. Today, I'm so excited, Josh. We have our third dookie on the show. Yeah, that's, that's our okay. Third, <laughs> our third dookie. We have ESPN College Hoops analyst, four-time Emmy nominee, and former Duke Blue Devil. Also, former fifth round pick, 108th in the draft, Jay Billis. How are you, Jay? I should have been 107th. I was better than that guy. That was such crap. Jay Scott Billis, I should say. Scott with one T. We were trying. Which has been a huge problem for me, by the way. I I think because my grandmother was from Scotland, my mom thought that would be a good idea. And it's wrong on my driver's license. And it causes me all (laughs) kinds of problems because nobody, (laughs) nobody thinks of Scott with one T. It's kind of, kind of ridiculous. Have you ever been like denied entrance, like, you know, into the country or something like this is you, (laughs) this one T. It hasn't been that bad, but you'll see it wrong on public documents, on things that are of, of import, including it was wrong on my driver's license for quite some time. And I did have problems at the airport here and there, but uh, but those got fixed. Man, uh, thanks for doing this. This is a blast. I know Josh has a ton of questions he wants to get to uh, regarding NIL and Duke and Coach K and all that stuff. But I'm I'm just fascinated. You you grew up in Southern California, right? How do you end up all the way across the country at Duke? So I was born in San Pedro, California, near the port of, port of Los Angeles, and I grew up in an area called Rolling Hills, which um, at that time was kind of small and really kind of idyllic near the water. And uh, never my parent, neither one of my parents had an opportunity to go to college. You know, my dad was a fisherman before I was born, and then he was a, a in the TV business. He was like a TV repair and sales guy and uh, had his own shop. Um, and then, you know, got into the real estate business, just buying properties as he made some more money. And, uh, I never, um, never really thought much of going away to college until I got recruited. And oddly enough, Rex, like the, when, when I was in high school, you know, we were lucky. We had a really good team. We all grew up together, played together from fourth grade through high school. So we were all really tight. But I didn't have a very good experience with my high school coach, and it it it, it was really miserable. Wow. And so when I was being recruited, all I cared about was who I was going to play for. And so I, maybe this is wrong, but I wasn't choosing a school; I was choosing a coach. Wow! And I came down to four guys: Coach K, who at Duke, who was the least well known, least successful; uh, Jim Beheim at Syracuse; Lute Olson was at Iowa, and a guy named Ted Owens, a uh, great guy. Uh, who was at Kansas. And that, that was, those were the four coaches I came down to. You didn't, you, you, there was no inclination to stay home and stay close. I mean, all those schools are pretty far away. Yeah. I, I, I would have preferred that. Um, so UCLA and USC were the, you know, my best options at home. And, but it was more sort of, I like those coaches better. And I was willing to go wherever I needed to go to play for who I wanted to play for. And, you know, the closest I came to stay at home was probably USC with Stan Morrison. Um, But, and if I were going to, the truth is, if I were going to live in California the rest of my life, I would have gone to USC. I mean, that, that USC alumni mafia is pretty powerful in LA. (laughs) And so if I were going to live in LA, I would have been a Trojan man, but I, you know, I wasn't thinking about where I was going to live after college. When uh, were you, a, were you always bigger than most of the guys your age? And when did you, when did you start to like see that? Okay, I'm better than they are in, in like high school. Or when was that for you? I was always a steady grower, so I was always a head or so taller than most of my classmates at whatever level. And so when I was a, a really little kid. Um, you know, I mean, there, there was a time once I got I got thrown out of the sandbox by a teacher who didn't know me, who thought I was too old for the sandbox when I was a little kid. You know, stuff like that happened. Um, but but I was always steady. And, uh, you know, my dad is six, eight and I wound up being six, seven, six, eight. Um, so that was always pretty steady. And I was one of those guys where when, when I was coming up in basketball that I, I felt like I was was a good player relative to my peers in my area, but I didn't know how that stacked up outside of it. And when I started playing, you know, outside of the, you know, my area, um, I, I wasn't sure that I, you know, I stacked up and I started getting ranked really highly. And, and I was the most surprised one. 
<laughs> um, and I, I actually went to a tryout for like this, this all-star team around Southern California. And I was honestly going just to see if I could measure up. I didn't have any intention that, or any belief that I could make the team. And it was a two day tryout. And there was a, a writer then who was really prominent still is named Frank Burleson. Yeah. And, uh, I was supposed to get my wisdom teeth out the next day. So I thought I'll go to the first day of tryouts, play all day and see how I do. And, uh, and I went to, you know, I was leaving with my dad after the end of the first day and we ran into Frank Burleson and he said, well, I'll see you tomorrow. And I said, well, I can't come back tomorrow. You know, I'm not going to make the team anyway. I'm getting my wisdom teeth out. And he said, make the team. He goes, you're the best player here. <laughs> and and wow. I was like, what I am. And, wow. uh, and it was funny. It's funny. Like that validation made me look at myself as a, as an expecting more of myself as a player when when people told me I was good before that, I, I wasn't sure, you know, I, I believed it with regard to, you know, my high school and local schools and all that. But outside of that, you know, you'd read about guys in the paper. You remember back then, Rex, like oh, there yeah. was street and Smith's when you got your name in street and Smith's, you're going, man, I must be legit. Like, Holy cow. Mm -hmm. And you read about these guys that were older and you saw their pictures in there is all black and white. Oh. And you, you, you had these thoughts about these guys being supermen and how do I measure up to these guys? And then when you got to that level, then I started, I started believing it and expecting more of myself. Man, that, that's just amazing. I, I love the journey. And then you get, you get to Duke, uh, you go to Duke and who's in your first class with you there. We were the number one ranked recruiting class that year in 1982. So we had uh, Mark Allery, Johnny Dawkins, David Henderson, uh, Weldon Williams and a guy named Bill Jackman, who was my roommate my freshman year. We were all ranked in the top 50 as players. Um, but, you know, it was wow. one of those things where you, you didn't have to deal with this like I did. But, you know, you, you'd, I, I didn't know what Johnny Dawkins looked like. I mean, I, I didn't know whether he was white or black. I mean, I, did, I had no idea. And he's 6'2". He looked like a stiff wind would blow him away. And then I, I started, I played pickup with them one day in Washington, D.C. before we, we wound up going to Duke is during the summer between our senior year and our freshman year of college. And, and I was like, this dude is Superman. Like, I, I couldn't believe how good he was. And then, you, you know, got to college, played against Len Bias and Michael Jordan, all those guys, and, and realized pretty quickly that, you know, when you're younger, the more you work, you know, the more you work, the better you got. And I didn't see a limit. And then you saw those guys and you go, okay, there's a limit. Like these guys are better and, <laughs> and there's no catching up to this. Like that, 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 whoever said all men are created equal was full of shit. Like that's not true. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. You, you said it came down to coaches and uh, Duke was not really on anyone's radar until really that class. You got in on the ground level. What you, what, what did coach K bring to the table that made you all want to go there? Yeah, Josh, that's, I, I, I'm not sure I've ever had a really good answer for that question because it was more a feeling than uh, a, a laundry list of attributes. Um, I liked him right away and I trusted him right away. And I didn't think about, and this shows like probably how arrogant we might have been. I didn't think about, well, he's not one yet. Like he's not done anything. And uh, that I, my thing was, well, you know, we will. Um, we're good. We like him. We'll do great. And we got our ass kicked our freshman year. Um, you know, we started all freshmen uh, against, you know, back when guys stayed yeah. around three, four years. Everybody did. I mean, my first game, uh, my first ACC game was in December of 1982. And I, I started, I was a starter as a freshman and I had to guard Ralph Sampson. <laughs> and uh, you're like, what? Uh, you know, I, I, I held him to 36, yeah. which was a <laughs> tremendous performance defensively. And I was, I was despondent after the game. I thought, I can't, I can't play at this level. I mean, that dude just lit me up. And then about two weeks later, three weeks, he hung 40 on Herb Williams and uh, Clark Kellogg against yeah. Ohio State. Ohio I was State. like, okay, maybe I, don't, maybe I don't suck that bad. <laughs> as long as you didn't have to play Ralph every night. It was right. so it was like playing against your dad in the driveway uh, when you're a little kid, like he, he'd back in. You had no chance. And no, we were and, just talking about that the other day with like, go back to Ralph and Sam Bowie, who mm -hmm. those two would be playing out shooting threes today. Right. Right. They would, and they could have done that then. But it was just such an era where, nope, you put your big ass down on the block and that's what you do. But they could have done. Well, there that. Were, yeah. 
they could have like there was no three point shot as you know that came in uh, probably your senior year in high school yeah. or maybe maybe just after Freshly, that or just Freshly before that nineteen eighty seven probably yeah but when when I was um, I, I was talking recently about Chet Holmgren the uh, the player the big guy from Gonzaga and people were talking about him being a unicorn and we've never seen anything like this guy and I'm, I'm a unicorn like <laughs> Ralph Sampson was better than Chet Holmgren like come on now um, that dude if Ralph Sampson had stayed healthy as a pro. Like he was a 2010 guy for years before he got hurt yep. and, and his knee problems, his injuries took away, you know, his superior athleticism and, and made him into a, a, a creaky, you know, kind of player uh, physically, but, you know, he was MVP of the all-star game in 85 and, and took him to the finals. I mean, he was ridiculously good. And, you know, that's why he's in the hall of fame and touch that feathery touch, everything, had, everything. He had but, it all. He you know, all. That, that was just, that's our era and yours. You know, growing up watching Patrick and Ralph, you know, that that era of college basketball, you have a great experience at Duke and then you go into law school or no, did you know, you went to play first. You played for yeah. two or three years overseas, right? Yeah, I got drafted by the Mavericks and I went to went to rookie camp and thought I did pretty well. But didn't realize they already had 13 guaranteed contracts. So you know, <laughs> they weren't going to cut somebody for me to be on the team. And, you know, I felt like I was good enough to play in the NBA, but not to play at a, at a, at a high level. I mean, I could have hung on with a team, but, but I got an offer to play in Italy, which was, you know, back then the minimum salary in the NBA was $75,000. Yes. And, and I got substantially more than that to play overseas. And I thought, okay, that's my level. And, and the truth is it was, it was actually really fun for me because I was one of those guys where I was a star in high school. And then I was a, a, a good, solid role player in college on a great team. And then I got to be a star again in Italy. Like I was one of the leading fun. scorers in Italy and it was really fun. Yeah. But after three years of it, I got an offer from Coach K to, to join his staff as a grad assistant. And, uh, and I, I happened to get admitted to law school at the same time. So it was his idea that I do both. Uh-huh. And so I went to law school and was an assistant coach. But being an assistant coach was pretty easy back then because we had Leitner and Grant Hill and Bobby Hurley and Thomas Hill. Yeah, so you know, you told the guys, you know, I'd sit in practice, going, I don't really need to say anything. I don't need to tell <laughs> these guys anything. They can do everything you want them to do. It's really not a. This is not coaching. You know, Coach K can handle this by himself. At what point uh, is it that you just? I mean, we say it all the time. You know, you're one of the best people behind the mic I've ever I've ever listened to. Uh, I've ever watched call a basketball game or talk basketball or talk life. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, at what point, Jay, did you know that? And, or did you know that you could have a, a career doing that? And what, what was the process? Did you had to, well, obviously you're, you're a study guy, you study everything, but when did you know, have an inkling that, you know, I could do this for a career? When I was in high school and started to get noticed as a player, um, it was probably the same for you. You know, when you get interviewed by local newspapers or things like that, they would always ask, what do you want to do after basketball? And the truth is, I didn't have a really good answer. And so I I thought, you know, back then it was it was about the time that former athletes started getting into broadcasting. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe that I said. uh, So I would say, well, I'd like to get into broadcasting. And, but I didn't know what it entailed. And when I was a kid, you know, my mom was always concerned that I would be some rockhead, you know, jock that didn't, wasn't cultured. So she, I I say, encouraged me. She forced me to do things I didn't want to do. So, you know, I was, a I had to take ballroom dancing uh, classes and I actually was a competitive ballroom dancer for a time when I was a young teenager. And I kept that a profound secret from all my friends. Yeah. I didn't tell anybody. And then, and, but, but it's kind of funny, like in, at the end of junior high school, I think I was in eighth grade, you know, you had to go through these school sponsored cotillion events. And so when, when these older ladies would come in and teach us ballroom dancing, you know, all these, all my friends were like tripping over their feet and I was dominating. (laughs) And because I'd been doing great football. I'd I'd been competing for a while in it. So they'd go, how do you know all this stuff? And I'm going, I'm an athlete. Like, how can you not like, you know, I just athletes pick this shit up. Like, how could you not do this? And so I just kind of did it that way. Foxtrot, <laughs> Tango, yeah. what was all of it? Foxtrot, <laughs> Rumbo, Waltz. I did it all. Uh, Cha Cha, you name it. 
And uh, so when, um, and I, you know, I won trophies and I kept them hidden. Like I kept them in a closet. Uh, I didn't put them with all my other trophies. What was on the top of those trophies? Because it wasn't, it wasn't the gooseneck. What was yeah, it like was it? Uh, it was wow. some of them were like uh like you know these uh angelic figures uh with wings <laughs> and then some of them actually had two people dancing which were not my most prized <laughs> possessions at that time <laughs> i wish i'd saved them because they'd be kind of funny now but they'd say you know like a uh, champion intermediate rumba and uh I, I i i didn't want my friends to see that you know i'd rather have them see all south bay or something than uh than i was a champion in intermediate rumba um <laughs> But but uh, but I did that. And then my mom made me take speech and debate courses in school. And oddly enough, the 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 teacher that I had in junior high school for that wound up taking a job at my high school at exactly the same time I went to high school. And so he was he was probably the best, honestly, the best coach I ever had until I got to Duke. Um, and I think all the things I did with him and in, in competitions, there were speech and debate competitions around Southern California that I competed in. Uh, there was no little red light on top of a, of a camera that was going to scare me after doing all that stuff. Uh, it really prepared me very well for um, law school, for, for just about anything, for any sort of presentation. And that was, that was really helpful. Um, but when, when, I got, when I got to college, um, you know, back then in recruiting, coaches could introduce you to alums back then. That was legal. And Coach K, all of them knew I had stated an interest in broadcasting. So uh, Coach K introduced me to a guy named Chuck Howard at ABC Sports, who's a big time producer back then. He gave me jobs during the summer. So I worked as a production assistant in the Olympics at uh, Monday Night uh, Baseball, um, the PGA Championship in 83 uh, at Riviera Country Club. And I did professional bowling events. I did just about everything. And it, it really was helpful sort of getting me um, I guess getting me into the business ultimately and, and having that be a, a choice, I guess, of mine to pursue. Well, you, you, uh, thank God that, that you did. Yeah. You, you've been the, the basketball voice of our generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, when we were young, it was like the Billy Packer, Al McGuire. And, and for, Dickie V. Dickie V for sure. Kay Wood Ledford yep, for, us, for us, you know, a legend. Um, but you were the guy that came in that, uh, spoke our language more. You weren't the, uh, you know, use the backboard yeah. guy, you know, <laughs> you know. And so you, for our, you've been our voice. And a thank you. Yes. And uh, how how's that felt for you? You've you've got to know that you are this generation. You know, Dickie V's a legend for he's Dickie V, baby. But for our coming up, you've been the voice. Uh, do people just? constantly come up and appreciate you. And I'm sure a lot of people, because it's polarizing business, think you're all Duke or whatever. Do you, do you get both ends when you go out? Do you get people appreciating and some people like, you don't know what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, that all that happens. And first of all, thank you for saying that. I, I think I was over the top and I'll, I'll, I'll take oh, it. That was very nice. Um, I think for me, um, do I realize sort of how, privileged and fortunate I've been to be at ESPN because the platform is what does, does it. Um, yes. And, and I've, I've tried over the course of, of my career to, uh, you know, the way I've looked at it is my job is to say the right thing at the right time in the right tone. And, you know, if I've ever had any problems, it's all, you know, it's mostly been tone, you know, you, you want to get your tone right. So that when you, when you're critical, it doesn't come off as being angry. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's been something I've always been mindful of. And I think as you start out, um, you know, you're trying to fit into what the role, what you think the role requires. And as I, I became more comfortable, uh, with myself and being more comfortable on the air, I started delving into areas that I felt were important that if my company was okay with it. So I, you know, I started talking about NCAA policy when it was appropriate. And, and I was one of those guys where, you know, I, I figured that people at home, when there's a bad call, they're talking about the call. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to be one of those guys that said, well, that's a really difficult call. And, uh, you know, it could go either way. You know, I, did, I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to say, no, that was a bad call. And here's why. Uh, or it's a good call. And here's why. If people were booing in the, in the stadium. Um, and, you know, that's caused some issues. Uh, the officials don't like it. They, they think you should stay out of it. That's not your area. You've never worn a whistle. And. 
And I always say, well, when, when some of them complain to me, I, I, I like to hear the complaints, first of all, because I want to know whether they think I'm right or wrong, or if I got, I want to get it right. Mm -hmm. But I always want to listen to that. Um, it's nice to be complimented, but if I'm willing to accept the compliment, I'd better be willing to accept criticism and act positively upon it. And the way I've looked at criticism is if it's right and it's reasonable, um, I act upon it. Uh, if it's unreasonable, I dismiss it. Uh, so I don't spend a lot of time worrying about what somebody says on Twitter or, um, you know, if you get some some fan that yells out something uh, that you think is unreasonable, I, that, that's part of the deal. Uh, the celebrity part of it, I think, is a perfect, um, it's kind of a perfect level uh, where I'm at, that uh, I'm not bothered very much um, because most people don't care. But when people, I've met a ton of people through, you know, sort of the pro, the, the higher profile of being on television and that's, uh, the interactions have been great. Um, so it's been like a kind of a comfortable level of uh, celebrity, I guess, if you want to call it, that that's been really, really nice. Um, and people are very nice. Um, you know, most come up if they want a picture, an autograph or whatever, or just interact. They're, they're very, very nice and complimentary. And I've met a ton of nice people uh, that way. Um, but it, but it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, you're Michael Jackson walking down the street and people are screaming. I don't have to worry about that. Well, speaking of now, you've been a, a critic a long time and, and, uh, really ahead of the curve with your criticism of the NCAA, how they've handled, um, amateurism and, and, and a lot of things. And now we're to this point that is switched so quickly and speaking of being our generation, it's hard to understand what's going on. For, can you tell us the difference between uh, the NIL and an NFT? Uh, yeah, I do know the difference. Um, I, I don't know the NFT world. I would like to get into it because it sounds very lucrative. Um, but yeah, name, image, and likeness. Uh, um, you know, it's amazing how this has, uh, this whole business has morphed uh, into something it's almost like we don't want to admit what it is. And so we're trying to, you know, shape it into something that goes along with the longstanding rhetoric of the NCAA. And, you know, I've said for years, you know, don't, don't listen to what they say, watch what they do. And if you listen to what they say, you would think this is solely about education and the development of young people and all that. But the truth is it's a multi-billion dollar entertainment industry that's run off college campuses. And that's not wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. But but we got to stop acting like this is Little League Baseball. It's not. Um, it, it's it's professional sports and it has been for 40, 50 years. And it, it, there's been a tremendous grab for revenue. Uh, but they've they've had the clamps on the revenue drivers being the players for all this time. And that's ended with the Alston decision before the Supreme Court. And so what, where the NCAA used to plant their flag on the principle of amateurism, that this sport is played by amateurs for the love of the game, that's gone now. And it's gone legally, it's gone in every respect. So they said, well, they just can't be employees. They can take advantage of, of opportunities in the marketplace for uh, commercials. If they want to run a camp, if they want to give uh, you know, tennis lessons or write a book, they can do that or appear in a movie. That's fine. But it can't bleed into recruiting. Because they know if they know that the players are more valuable than almost anything else in this system. So I, like just for example, I got a, I got a text message the other day when, when Miami got a player from Kansas State named Nigel Pack, the, the reporting was that he had, he had uh, inked a, an $800,000 two-year deal with a collective uh, from Miami. And uh, Miami assistant coach had texted me saying, that's more than I make. And, and I was like, he's worth more than you are. Um, and that's the truth. I mean, a, a great player is more is worth more than a strength coach or an assistant coach. And we've been operating under this fiction that you can pay a str boy. These strength coaches are worth $750,000 a year. Uh, they're paying, uh, they're paying these guys a ton of money. And I'm not saying they're not worth it, but I'm saying the players are worth a hell of a lot more than a scholarship. And yeah. we're seeing that now. Well, what's going to happen, Jay? Oh, I mean, right now with I remember asking, who was it? Orlando Antigua uh, a summer or two ago, you know, what are the rules? Are there rules on this NIL? And he was basically like, I don't think so. You know, this was before it kind of popped off. And now, you know, young brains making a lot of money. That's a whole other, you know, a topic. 
but this is the world we live in. What's going to happen with all? And uh, apparently there are many coaches who feel like, you know, their teams are being, you know, cherry picked. People are coming in and recruiting kids on other campuses. Do you see that going on? And have you seen it going on? I do see it going on and hear about it going on. I don't know all the inner workings of it because you're not privy to all of the different conversations that go on and, and exactly how it happens. But, um, you know, we're at this point because the NCAA was flat footed with regard to these changes, the, the, these inevitable things that were coming. So they decided they, want to, they wanted to fight this out in court and they thought they were going to win. I didn't think they were going to win. Uh, but they thought they were going to win and they got eviscerated uh, by the Supreme court. So they decided to sort of, to use a, a, a sports analogy to move the goalposts. So they moved them from amateurism to employment and they want to keep it away from recruiting. You know, it's funny when, because we, we, your point about cherry, cherry picking players, you know, so one, one school decides that they want a player off another roster and they make a make a move for them. That happens with assistant coaches all the time and head yeah. coaches. Yeah. Uh, you know, another school comes and says, "Hey, you know, we want you. I want you on my staff, or we want you as our head coach." And they don't call that cherry picking. They call that business. Yeah. And but but with players, it's it's called cherry. You know, cherry picking or um, tampering or yeah. they're rating. You know, they're rating our 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 team. You know, stuff like that. And because we haven't we haven't done this before. It hasn't happened before, but it's going to keep happening. And where I think it's headed to your earlier question, I think we're headed toward uh, a school just like they do with any employee. Instead of offering a player a scholarship and a stipend uh, and then letting them know, hey, this is what our other players are getting uh, in the marketplace, they'll just start offering them contracts. And, and that will be much more orderly down the line. I mean, in my view, the, these schools know exactly whom to recruit and exactly whom to put on the floor when they need to win. They know how much to pay and who's worth what to them. Just like when they, you know, all these schools, whether it's Kentucky or Duke or whatever, they have tens of thousands of employees. Duke has over 30,000 employees. They are not sitting in a room saying, what do we pay all these different people? I mean, the, the head of the landscape department works harder than the president of the university. I mean, we can't pay we can't pay the president more than the head of the landscape department. And what about food service professionals? I mean, they work their ass off. Yeah. Uh, they're not doing that. And they're not. If we were really worried about competitive balance and fairness, you would see all these schools revenue share and they would have caps on what they could spend on facilities or travel or things like that. But we don't have any of that. The only spending control we've had in college athletics has been the players. And I, I think you're seeing this fight because they know where this will ultimately head, that, you know, revenues keep rising. The NCAA has tried to make this seem like it's a zero sum game, that there's a certain amount of money and, and how are we going to pay for all this when revenues keep going up? I mean, the Big Ten's about to sign a, a $1 yeah. billion dollar a year deal for their media rights, which is going to pay their institutions wow. $80 million a year or something crazy like that. So th there'll be more money available, but how you allocate your, your budget, people are going to say, do we really need these facilities when it's more important to, to acquire talent? Do we need to have all of these assistant coaches and all these different people that we have on staff when it's, when the money's better allocated toward getting players? Cause we don't need a big staff. We need talented teams. And that's where this is headed, is signing players to contracts, in my view. Well, it's the facilities that, that they put all the money into. It was about recruiting. You yes. know, now it's like they don't need to see their practice gym and all that because they're going to get a contract. So they, they can play in any gym. It's, you know, that was – so I, that makes a, a great point. But in, in that regard, do you think we're headed to something like um, – the Yankees, you know, it, obviously it's how a school prioritizes a sport and whatnot, but uh, do you start looking at like Kentucky has like a $2 billion endowment, right? Uh, Duke has a $12 billion endowment, endowment and like Texas has a $30 million. It, it, are you just getting to a point where the schools, like the rich schools and states has billionaires like Texas or a school like Memphis who has FedEx there or uh, Washington who has... Uh, the tech up there, are they just going to start getting all the players because they have more money? Well, I, I think we have that now. 
um, we have schools, all these schools have different resources. So Alabama is the Yankees of football and they don't just win because Nick Saban is there. They win because of the financial investment they've made. You know, their facilities are off the charts and, you know, they provided attractive environments for the best players and they play in a great league, all that stuff. The players know that they've had a great success rate, not only of winning, but of putting players in the NFL, things like that. So, you know, Alabama and uh, Clemson, places like that, um, are ahead of the curve. There, there's no, you know, it's not like it's not like Major League Baseball is throwing their hands up, going the Pittsburgh Pirates can't compete with the Yankees. They they do it, and and you know the Yankees may win more, but but they still compete. I think where this ultimately winds up is you'll see um, that the upper echelon of college sports um, break away. And now whether it's the power five starting their own thing, that's certainly a possibility because they don't want to share their money with everybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but also what I would do and what I think is, is a near certainty in the future is you'll have a division that's much smaller than it is now. The idea that in college basketball, we can have 354 teams compete successfully against one another in D one is ludicrous. We can't. (laughs) <laughs> um, but, but they all, they all want a, a chance to be Gonzaga or St. Peter's or something like that and try to use that to advance their institution, make more money, all that you, stuff, you know, be more relevant. St. You got St. Yeah. Peter's in there on us. Mm-hmm. I heard uh, it. But I what heard. they'll, what I think will happen is, is if you reduce the size of division one in basketball down to say 120 teams, like it is in football or 150, wh- whatever you want it to be. What that means is every good player is going to want to play on that level. And so you'll have. Uh, more talent spread out over fewer units. So you'll have the benches will be better. They'll be able to absorb players leaving early or transferring uh, a little bit easier. And where all this lies is roster limits because we're not going to see the five best quarterbacks go to Alabama every year because the second best quarterback will not want to sit behind the best. one. And you're not going to see, like when Jalen Hurts was sitting behind Tua Tungabailoa, he left and went to Oklahoma and almost won a Heisman Trophy there. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see talent spread out based upon things like that. Uh, Roster limits will take care of it. You you may have the best players going to the top top teams, but you'll see – you'll see other talent go other places where they can, they can be successful and uh, um, money will be a part of those decisions. It won't be the sole reason that that players go somewhere. Just like money is not the sole reason that any of us take a job, but it's a factor. And now it can be a factor for players. Uh, about a month or so ago, uh, it was announced that Mark Emmert is stepping down from the NCAA. And I just, Real quick, put out on Twitter was the first thing I thought of Jay Billis for president, NCAA president, and people loved it. Loved it. Would you ever consider that? That that's like uh, that's like offering me the helm of the Titanic after it hit the iceberg. Um, I, I don't I don't think I'd want to take that. Um, but, but you know they they've run this thing into the ground. You know from a, a governor's perspective and and have miscalculated every step. I, I still think there's a role for the NCAA going forward, but it's going to be greatly diminished. And you know you guys probably remember back when we were kids, the AAU was the most powerful athletic organization on the planet. They chose the Olympic team. Um, they, everything flowed through the the amateur athletic union uh, with regard to, to sports in America. And now they run summer basketball tournaments and that's it. And that's part of where the NCAA is headed. They'll still have a role in eligibility, maybe some rules enforcement, maybe academic requirements or something for initial eligibility, but that'll be it. And the conferences will take this over and you'll see decisions made by, uh, by the institutions themselves uh, because they're all market competitors. I mean, that's what's been ignored in this is that, these conferences and these schools are all market competitors against one another and they compete for talent. They compete for media rights dollars. They certainly compete on the field and on the floor, um, but they're going to make decisions based upon what's best for them. And that's the way markets work. Uh, so I think we're going to see more of that going forward, which is why salaries went up in the, in the eighties, because, you know, the NCAA used to tell schools how often they could be on television. If you can believe that. That's right. That's right. And uh, yeah, they, they would tell them, hey, you know, Notre Dame, you can only play on television once uh, a month. 
uh, and the schools got tired of it and they sued the NCAA and, and they went to the Supreme Court. And so when the NCAA lost that case, that's when you saw these media rights deals go through the roof and coaches' salaries went up and nobody said, hey, this is not what college sports is supposed to be about. Um, they, they, they went after the money. And you can't expect the players to just say, well, you know, you guys keep going. We'll just we'll just sit here and take our, you know, take our educational opportunity and move on. That, that's not the way the, the multi-billion dollar industries work. Um, I would talk a little bit about Coach Kate first. Can you believe that he's retiring? I still haven't wrapped my head around it. Like for uh, again, for us, it's like, well, it's like for us when Dean Smith retired years ago. He's that he's that guy to. Many people, you know, my son doesn't know a basketball world without Mike Krzyzewski. Um He's widely known in Kentucky as the eighth best college coach of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got you got Rupp and Paul, <laughs> Sutton, Patino, Gillespie. Gillespie's Gillespie. nine. Uh, Cal, Wooden, and then Coach K, I think, is yeah. the way people That's think the about way it him. Goes so here. he's a legend. So, no, what do you think? How proud are you? of being in on the, on the ground level and in total his, the program, the success, um, and now he's not there. It, it is really weird. It's weird. It, you know, next season it's going to, it's not going to make, make yeah, sense. John Shire's coming in. How do you think John Shire's going to do it? Well, I, first I think John Shire will do a great job. He, he's not only really smart, he's got a great demeanor, He's built for this, and uh, so I think he'll kill it. Uh, he's already done extraordinarily well on the recruiting trail. He's got the number one recruiting class coming in. They've got some transfers coming in. They'll, they'll be really good really fast, and I think he'll he'll do extraordinarily well. Uh, to your point about Coach K, like, I, I think he's going to be the hardest act to follow in the history of sports, yeah. that not only was he extraordinarily successful over a 42-year period, he did it all on television and the internet and social media. You know, John Wooden, Dean Smith, most of Dean Smith's productive career was in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. And uh, he did well into the 90s, but but he didn't have the same sort of visibility that Coach K has had uh, because of the timing of, of their career. And, uh, you know, Wooden, hardly any of his stuff was really on television. Yeah. So uh, he, he's a, he's become iconic in that way. And for me, you know, I just feel really lucky that not only did I play for him and and ha have had him as a you know coach, friend, mentor for all these years. I mean, I'm 58 and and he just retired. I mean, for me to have that all those years, you know, I was extraordinarily fortunate. Um, I, the thing I'm kind of looking forward to, honestly, though, is is having the off season Coach K all year now. Yeah, because uh, he's a hell of a lot more fun to be around in the offseason <laughs> during the season because he's such a focused guy. And I think what people find, you know, now that that he's going to be in a different light is what a really good guy he is. He, he's not just a great coach and leader and all that stuff. He's a really good guy. And one of the things I mean, you guys, will this will probably resonate with you. Um, one of the things that I always think back on as, as a reason for why he's so good is in, in 92, when I was a grad assistant, uh, and, and Kentucky and Duke played in that, you know, amazing overtime game you know, at Philly that later hit that shot at the end. Um, what coach K did after that game, I still think is, is one of the amazing, most amazing things I've ever seen. So after that shot went in, everybody's going nuts and, you know, Kentucky's devastated. Uh, the Duke people are, are thrilled. Um, Coach K went over. That was K. Wood Ledford's last game. And Coach K went over just as they were signing off, went over to his courtside position and put a headset on to one, you know, sort of honor Led, uh, K. Wood Ledford's career and acknowledge it and to tell Kentucky fans how amazing their team was. And I'm not sure that how many people would have had the presence of mind to do that. And, you know, it just kind of showed like he, he does have a lot of empathy. Like he wants to win like everybody else. And he would have been devastated if they lost and all that stuff. But, but he thinks beyond um, the moment and to what everything really means. And, uh, and I, that, that always has stood out to me as, as a pretty cool thing that he did, but just understanding the moment and what everything meant to everyone involved, I thought was pretty damn cool. Yeah, it was.
Yeah. And to your point, I, he is, you know, of course, people around Kentucky there, they don't like Mike Krzyzewski, that average fan, uh, just the Duke, whatever. But to your point, I had, I had been arrested eight years ago, uh, had been in rehab and was really fresh out of rehab in 2015 when uh, the, the final four was in Indianapolis, right, correct? Right. And I had really hadn't been out back out in public. It was still, you know, I was still very uh, uneasy about being in public. And I was at the final four and I was on the walking, you know, down near where the benches were. And Coach K made eye contact with me and motioned for me to come up, you know, onto the floor. I went up on the floor. He shook my hand and said, hey, just wanted to hug you. Proud of you. And I don't, you know, I've known him through you guys all these years. You know, I've known him. If I go watch one of their practices, we'll sit, sit and talk. But it was just so, it, I think about it, it makes me want to cry. It was just so sweet. It was just so nice. And he was definitely doing that for only one person. And that was me. Right. So, well, and that, that's sort of, that, that, that's another example of he's just a good dude. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he's really funny. He's fun to be around. He's not fun to be around after you turn the ball over or, <laughs> uh, you know, do something stupid on the floor. I, I can I can attest to that. It, it, but, but he can he can, you know, jump you uh, if you're a player. But, uh, you know, there's never been anyone more supportive uh, that I've had in my life uh, than, than him. And, uh, and he's a deep thinker, like he thinks about things and he's, he's got a great awareness and, and that's a, that's a really good example of it. Yeah. I, um, uh, he's just, he's amazing. I, I don't know what it's going to be like, uh, without him in, in college basketball. Where do you see our Kentucky Wildcats these days? What's going to happen with our cats? I think they'll continue to do what they've been doing. I mean, one of the things that I've found amazing is, narratives that go around the game and both Kentucky and Duke, you know, they've been referred to as one and done programs. And, uh, and they'll, you know, there are a lot of old timers or old time thinkers that say, Hey, can't win with freshmen. Can't, can't win with one and dones. You're like, yeah, you can. Cause they've done it. Uh, both Calipari and coach K have won national championships with one and done teams. Uh, the truth is they win more than and knock on the door more than other programs that that are you know have three and four year guys. Um, there are a bunch of different ways of doing it. And when I was probably a little bit honestly uh, of an old school thinker when Calipari got to Kentucky and that 2010 team, I thought, okay, these guys are super talented, but come on now, are they going to be able to to win a championship with that group? And and I was proven totally wrong. Because, you know, they, they not only could have won, they were right there to do it. They got beat by West Virginia in the, yeah, in the Carrier Dome yep. when that one, yeah, when that one, three, one zone got them and they shot the ball so poorly, but they were good enough to beat anybody. Yeah. And, uh, and they almost did it in 2015, uh, the year you're just talking about, they were 38 and 0. And the only team, the only team that I felt could beat them was Wisconsin. Yeah. We talked about all year. What's the matchup that's going to give them the, the, the biggest period like Wisconsin. Because, you know, they're ball control, you know, they rebound defensively really well. They do this, they, you know, they're older, all that crap. And had they gotten past that game, which they almost did, uh, they would have won it all. I really believe that. But, um, you know, I think they'll continue to be really good. Uh, last year was an anomaly as far as, as you know, and, and it goes to show you, like, last year was the oldest team they probably yeah. ever had. Yeah. And, uh, and they played poorly and got beat. Um, it, it, you know age and experience are great, but they're not a guarantee. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of Kentucky fans who have said, Hey, put our 2015 team against St. Peter's or give us our 2010 team or something like that. We'll take the young guys, um, and, uh, and see how they do. Well, well, to your point. Um, yeah, I, if it's a one and done tournament, you know, if it was a series, if it was, you know, five game series and that thing, you'd see Duke and Kentucky winning championship. There'd be a whole lot more of them because they had the best teams, you know, there'd be, but it's a a one and done. But speaking of narratives, you talk about one of the narratives going around right now uh, about Kentucky and Cal is that he runs an archaic offense. And uh, NBA scouts and people are starting to creep into, and I'm sure it's starting to creep into uh, 
uh, visits, recruiting visits for me. I don't know enough about basketball to know if that's true. I've watched it my whole life. I played it. I don't not at your level. Is there anything to that? Does he run a, an archaic offense? I don't think so. I mean, it, there's a lot of dribble drive motion associated with it. I mean, I think it, it, that's a eye of the beholder type of deal. And if you, you, you have some teams that run set play offenses, you don't see as much motion as you used to because it's a little bit harder to, to teach and control. Um, and coaches don't like giving up control. I know you guys have probably <laughs> noticed that. Um, I, I do see uh, a lot, you know, there, there are teams that are going more towards um, European style offenses where there's uh, maybe Golden State Warriors type stuff where there's a lot more movement. Uh, and that's one of the things I appreciate most about the NBA is they make more passes per possession in 24 seconds than you see in college, which are, are oftentimes more ball control. Uh, you, because you have more teams, you'll see more, more styles and you'll have more ball control teams. Um, you know, look, the best teams are the ones that, that play ahead of the defense more often and get more transition opportunities. Um, but when you, I, I think it's easy when, when some, some folks look at, at teams, offensive schemes, to break it down just into, um, you know, what do they run in a half court set? And, and is it something that, uh, people can relate to or that they, they appreciate, um, Cal's teams put a lot of pressure on the rim. They've always been really good in transition and they're always pretty good at offensive rebounding. Um, and those are the, you know, to me, if you get, if you get more opportunities at the rim, which, which, can lead to more free throws. If you dominate the rim and the lane and you dominate the free throw line and you can stretch a defense. So you've got to be able to shoot it today. Uh, people talk about spacing all the time. Spacing doesn't mean dick. Like you've got to be able to stretch the defense so you can have a non shooter space the floor. Great. It's not going to stretch the defense. And so you got to be able to stretch the defense in order to be good. And so the more shooters you have on the floor, you know, last year, for example, you had, you had teams playing off Xavier Wheeler, and packing the packing the lane on them, and uh, you know they had to go out and guard Kellen Grady. They didn't have to yeah. guard Wheeler. So if you can if you can get guys that can shoot it, and then and then that's going to open up driving lanes, put pressure on the rim, and get you to the free throw line more often. Um, I, I don't care whether you run flex, you can run a wide flex, a tight flex, you can run you know sets out of a horn set or do whatever you want. Um, but if you don't have guys that can stretch a defense, uh, it's going to make it difficult. Well, speaking of, you know, uh, narratives and rhetoric, Kentucky has had it rolling. So has Duke. But 10 years ago, Kentucky was the best recruiting team in the country. And then it's very much been Kentucky Duke the whole time. And now it, you can't help. Duke is the best top recruiting team in the country. What do you think their pitch is that's different than Kentucky's? What, how do you think they've taken control? Because they're dominating now. And, and, uh, you know, as a, as a fan base, the BBN, we're worried. What do you think they're doing, saying to these kids that maybe Cal isn't? I don't, I don't know the answer to that because I'm not privy to all those sort of discussions they're having with, with players. But I, I do, you know, just from looking at their rosters and how recruiting has been changing, um, there's, there's now a decision to be made. You know, five years ago, six years ago, you were, you were getting your best players out of high school. You know, now you can get them through transfers. And, and so you have to make really intelligent decisions with regard to who you're bringing in. And, and the other part of it is, you know, you can bring in a freshman, lose them either to the NBA or to transfer. Uh, so if, if they're coming in as a, as a freshman, their fourth fiddle, they may not want to stick around uh, for the next year. Yeah. And when you bring, you know, my son was a, a walk on at Wake Forest and, and he pointed this out to me. He said, you know, it, it can be difficult when you've got you've had guys there for a couple of years, and then you you bring in a, a grad transfer and recruit over them from a transfer perspective. When guys are coming behind them, players seem to get that. They don't they don't get when you're when you're bringing in a, a, a guy that is older than they are. But you um, don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. And and, you know, you would think that players are. You know, I think there have been times, it, it might not be that much, there have been times at Kentucky over the years, maybe Archie Goodwin was one of them, where, where a guy decides to go pro 
And, you you know, from the outside, you kind of think, well, there may be an element of that, that he wasn't sure how much he was going to play on his college team right. next year. Right. Right. Sure. Right. You know, and, and Kentucky's had to deal with that kind of stuff. So I, I think Cal's recruiting job is harder than most. You know, most places know that they're going to get freshmen uh, and they're going to they're going to build with them. They may lose a couple of them, but they're going to do it that way and maybe take an occasional transfer. Um, he, he's got to go out and get the top talent uh, and satisfy, you know, people who want high recruiting rankings and then, you know, mess with the transfer portal and make sure that it all works out from a relationship standpoint. That That's a difficult spot yeah. for, for all yeah. these coaches to be in. If 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 Cal were to retire in three years or something happened, he wanted to move on. Who are some of the, the star rising coaches in programs that, that Kentucky or, or any of the blue bloods, if, if Bill Self was to retire would really be targeting right now? Well, there, I mean, there are so many of them, you know, Nate Oates at, uh, at Alabama is one of those guys that um, runs a, a fabulous offense. And, you know, when he had Herb Jones a couple years ago, you know, they were really good defensively. I think the thing that held them back this last year from being as good as I thought they could be was, was they didn't defend at, at as high a level as they needed to. Um, but he's one of those guys that is a next level thinker on the offensive end, uh, really good with analytics, things like that. There's so many guys now that are really capable, but we've had, it, it, it's amazing. Like when you guys brought up John Wooden before. And, you know, when we were kids, like when, when I was a kid in LA, John Wooden retired when I was like in fifth grade and uh, he was 65. And I thought he was the oldest man that yeah. ever lived. <laughs> you know, now these guys are going to se- like coach K is 75 and the ACC has got all these, you know, 70 year old coaches, Leonard Hamilton, Jim Laranega. These yeah. guys are going deep into their sixties and into their seventies. And I think that has had an impact on, you know, the amount of quality young coaches that we can identify, you know, and say, hey, he's the next guy, all that stuff. You know, even Mark Few has been in the game for 20 some years. And, you know, you know Jay, I would have said, you know, like if, if you'd asked me this question six months ago, I would have said Jay Wright. Jay Wright. You know, he's right. he's the next guy. And right. uh, and you know, I know he was he was uh, talked talked to by Kentucky when they hired Cal. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, Billy Donovan was talked about and Jay Wright, guys like that. You know, Kentucky is, if not the premier job in in basketball, it's in the top three. And so they're going to have their pick of the litter. Um, it, it's it's a fantastic place. And uh, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir on that. But, you know, my 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 niece and nephew went to Kentucky. My brother lives in Louisville. I'm there all the time. Nice. My, my nephew was actually a uh, student body president of Kentucky. So I used to tease Cal all the time. Uh, I think it was like 2013 or something like that. I would tease Cal. I said, Hey, you may be running the basketball program, but a Billis is running the university. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So good. So good. Uh, Jay, um, if you had the first pick in the draft, you take Boncaro, Holmgren or Jabari Smith. I take Jabari Smith. Um, but I might be wrong in that. Like it, it, this reminds me of a couple of years ago when LaMelo ball and uh, Anthony Edwards were coming out, James Wiseman. And, and, you know, it, it was, a, a you know, I had the beholder choice. And, and I had said at the time, you know, a lot of our draft experts thought you take LaMelo ball. And I, I, I thought Anthony Edwards was the best prospect. And, you know, you can reasonable minds can differ on that. I think this is a similar year where you've got three guys where, you know, the three of us, could could differ and all have a different choice and none of us are wrong yeah um now we may look back in 10 years and there they're, it seems obvious but um like smith is built for the nba the other guys are too but but he's a kevin durant type jump shooter and uh really skilled uh and he rebounds his position he can defend and switch um a, a number of positions i really like his makeup um, but Holmgren uh, from Gonzaga really uh, is intriguing because, you know, his body doesn't look like it's going to hold up, but I think it will. And he's so good at keeping his body away from offensive players that are trying to get into his body that he can block and change shots at a high rate without, you know, without getting muscled. He, he can get muscled at times. He's not a perfect player. He can. But he's but so skilled. You know, I. I had so many people during the tournament talk uh, saying to me, Oh, Holmgren's soft. He's not soft. Is he? he's just mm-hmm. weak. He's just weak right now. Cause he competes, doesn't he? He really competes yeah. and and he he's tough minded. 
uh, and I think he's going to do really well. It's just I'm not used to, um, and that's where the old school part of me has to has to evolve even more. I'm not used to seeing that body type, and so it gives you a little bit a little bit of pause. Um, but he's really durable. He's not one of these guys where where you know because he's built like a stick figure. You think, well, how are his knees going to hold up? How's he going to do that? How's he? He, he doesn't have injury problems. Yeah. There, there's no red flag there. Uh, he's not sat out any games. Um, and he plays his butt off all the time. And he's a great young man. Um, so I think it's going to be one of the harder number one decisions we've seen in a while. Because all three of them make a pretty good case for it. Uh, you know, who knows? Like, when we look back in 10 years, kind of like the 03 draft, LeBron was the no-brainer number one. Um, but heck, you had Carmelo in that draft and Dwayne Wade right. and Chris Bosh, all of whom are, are Hall of Fame locks. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, we could look back in 10 years and say, why didn't anybody take Jaden Ivey of Purdue number one? Right. I mean, that, that's certainly possible because right. he's he's that type of that type of talent. We just got three guys that uh, that seem to have taken the lead in that discussion. Will you uh, I, I always <laughs> tell Rex to bring this up. He's coined a phrase. Oh. That I think it's you should uh, adopt it. Well, I don't know. It's not really a phrase. Well, you know, we have the three level scorers, uh, Stephen Curry and Trey Young. They're they're four level scorers. <laughs> he they, scores at all four. Levels. All four levels. Right. <laughs> so we, we need to add another level to our, our thing. And pretty soon somebody will shoot from half court. they will be a five level scorer <laughs> once they go past half court. We need that because uh, <laughs> what, what's a good shot for those guys, you know, is traditionally in the old way of thinking a bad shot. Yeah. But it, it's amazed me, um, and I've been I've been a, a a big part of of this this I think uh, as far as being behind is that it, how long it's taken us to realize what an asymmetrical threat that three point shot is, yeah. yeah, and and how you know how much uh, you know maybe how we underutilized it in past years. And, you know, the old school guys will say, ah, you know, I don't want to watch people launch threes all the time. What happened to the mid-range jump shot? Well, you know, we took the mid-range jump shot back then because there was no three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, why, why are baseball players swinging for the fences all the time? Is because you score a run by doing that. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're, it's kind of Earl Weaver was ahead of the curve back in the day when his, his theory was walk, hit, three run homer. You know, he wanted bangers out there yeah. and, you know, they either strike out or they hit a home run now. And people are like, Oh, I liked it when they, we hit and run and uh, there's first and third defense and all that. Well, okay. But, but that's not, that's not the way it is. Back. That's not the way it, these guys are not making these decisions because it loses. Yeah. They're making these decisions because it wins. That's right. And uh, right. and I think the NBA is as exciting as hell. I, I watch yeah. it all the time. I can't get enough. The pendulum swings. The, do you think that uh, the game goes to where it is, you know, four level scores? And do they add a four point shot? Or do you think there's some somebody comes along that's a shack like freak that you can't play small ball against him? Like it's just you can shoot threes or defend this guy who's always going to score. <laughs> Two points. Like, it, where does the where does the game go in six years? I think if you had a, a Shaq type player come along again, uh, you would see that particular team adapt uh, an offense to take advantage of it. I just don't think you're ever going to see the '90s NBA again, where you had a you know a low post big guy and then a big enforcer foreman yeah. that couldn't shoot outside of eight feet. Yeah. You know, you're going to every position is going to have to stretch the floor now yeah. uh, so you can open up the floor and attack. Uh, and that's what, to me, is so beautiful about the game. It has evolved and will continue to evolve. But, you know, these players are so skilled now. I, I don't know what it is about basketball. You guys tell me if you think this is wrong, but you never hear this in another sport. Nobody ever says, do you think Tom Brady could uh, could sit in the pocket if he had to deal with Ray Nitschke and Dick Butkus? You know, they never say that. And and nobody ever says, nobody ever says, Simone Biles, you think she'd win a gold medal if Olga Corbett was in the field? Come on. <laughs> you know, we don't do that crap. And and we don't say, we don't say, you think Mike Trout could have hit Kent DeCulvey's like sidewinder stuff? You know, nobody says that. But in basketball, we seem to think that the old timers were better. Yeah. yeah. And, and some of them were. Like, I'm not saying Jordan wouldn't be the right. same dominant player now. But give me a break. Like, yeah. like. 
the the guys from from our era, Rex. Like, do, do you think any of them that are saying right now, like, hey, th- these guys today couldn't have played with us? Do you think any of them would say that? Well, but let's be honest, we couldn't have played with Oscar Robertson back in the '60s. Yeah. Like basketball basketball players stopped being good with us. Yeah, and then <laughs> right. everything went downhill. Yeah, right, like, that on. is such crap, and I don't know why we keep doing it. These guys are better than they've ever been. I, dude, and you know how it was, Jay. If I I would if I scored. Uh, 10,000 points, 9,900 of them were with my right hand. These guys, you know, can go with their off hand, fling up a shot lefty off the glass in traffic. They can do everything with both hands. Their handles, it used to be take what the defense gives you, right? Just take what – now they can hit you with prepackaged moves. <laughs> I mean, yeah. didn't have that stuff. And Steve Kerr, Steve Kerr is in our camp on that about stop talking about the players of yesteryear being better yeah. than today. They're not. Come on. And, you know, when people say you think Steph Curry could have could have played back in the in the 90s when it was this hard, you know, tough game. You know, Steve's kind of looking at him going, I, I played in the 90s. Like, I, was, <laughs> I was on those teams. You know, like, like, he looks at him. I mean, he's so nice about it. He looks at him sideways. Going, don't, don't try to sell that here. You know, yeah, kind of, come on. Yeah. Serena Williams now serving to Chrissy Everett Lloyd. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, but I mean, Chris come Everett on. Yeah, that's Lloyd exactly right. She didn't have a wooden racket. That's right. You know, if she, she had, had a metal racket, yeah. she'd have been. Jay, tough. what's your favorite movie, bud? Uh, all time, it's probably The Godfather. Nice. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of old school in that regard. I, w- I would go Godfather all the time being my favorite because whenever it comes on, I always watch it. That and the Shawshank Redemption. I don't know why I watch the Shawshank Redemption. I know how it ends. Same. And, yeah. uh, and it gets me every time. Me too. too me too. What about uh, sit down for dinner? Anyone dead or alive? Uh, well, I, I, I gave this answer a while back and Sean McDonough said, uh, Sean McDonough said, you didn't put me in there. And I said, all right, I'd like to have dinner with you dead. <laughs> I would probably go I would probably go with uh with people from different disciplines like so I would love to to sit down with uh with Muhammad Ali um and and, and have dinner Bjorn Borg is somebody I would love to, oh, to yeah. sit and listen to because I was he was an idol of mine when I was growing mm. up and uh, and I think I think I would would love to um, I would love to sit down with like Jackie Joyner Kersey mm. and uh, and listen to that or maybe Edwin Moses and yeah. listen to oh, listen yeah. to that stuff about the Olympics and and all that um, and, and hear that. Uh, and we had one of our best pods, I think, when I enjoyed we had Martina Navratilova on and she it was amazing to hear what you know yeah. about her coming from the Czech Republic and and she when she came over uh she couldn't come out because it was illegal what might affect what? her immigration status yeah it was and then someone outed her just what a what a life yeah but, yeah um and then what about front row center for a group or music performer dead or alive I'm I'm a huge Rolling Stones fan so any any opportunity to see the stones, um, I would I would take. So if you go back, especially when they were really rolling uh, in the late '60s, early '70s, and then um, and then if I could go back and see, I never got to see Led Zeppelin live. Oh, nice. uh, I would love to love to see you know Robert Plant, John Bonham, and John Paul Jones, Jimmy Page, all those guys. Jay, can't thank you enough for doing this, buddy. We're gonna let you go. Let come back. And Always a here. pleasure, gentlemen. Thanks. Great. It's too bad we couldn't do this back in the day when, when you know, back in the '60s when when podcasts were really good. <laughs> Brent Musburger's podcast <laughs> was unbelievable. I'll tell you what, you know, I, I may need to amend my answer because sitting down with Brent Musburger at any time would be would be the real deal. That yeah, dude yes. has had yeah. a life, man, a life. and he is as fun as hell. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I might need to add Musburger in there. That's a good call. Yeah, nice. it is. Thanks, Jay. Let's do it again. Thank someday. you, guys. Jay Billis. Jay Scott Billis. Jay Scott Billis. Uh, another uh, in the long line of make us feel like shit about ourselves. Exactly. Again, we're changing the pod name to yep. two dipshits who... Have have guests on that make them feel like shit about yeah, themselves. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes. How about that? With your homeboy from the L-Town. That's right. Dipshit. <laughs> How about Jay? Uh, God, what a big brain on that guy, mm. huh? Just a 
professional basketball player, lawyer, best analyst in the world. Just obviously unbelievable communicator. Oh gosh, hilarious! Uh, uh, we t- never laughed that hard on this. you and I both. <clears throat> and um, I it, articulate thinker. Yeah, just yeah. thinks articulate. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. I'm always. Yeah. Do you have? Uh, that? I mean, I know. I, uh, I know. Me. Uh, uh, <laughs> are you left-handed? <laughs> It's like, no, he's, he's great. amazing. He's great. Uh, all right, bud. Well, that was a lot of fun. That was episode 43. We'll be back soon. Uh, ASAP with episode 44 of the Rex Chapman show with my super dope homeboy from the L town, Josh Hopkins, powered by basketballnews.com. See ya.